Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nicole. I am a PhD student over in the, univers in the University of the Department of Geography. You, you, you will have to use the mic. Okay. You may have to adjust it. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Much better. Um, as I was saying, I'm a PhD student over at the University of <coughs> the Department of Geography. Um, this is my 11th year at KU, so <laughs> not all of it in the PhD program. I'll give you a little bit of my background so you can kind of see where I'm coming from um, in terms of how I'm approaching the topic of today. And I thank you for coming out today. I know this is not an easy topic to hear about, talk about, discuss. It's not been easy for me for the last three years of my research either. Um, the way that I've uh, structured the, the talk that I'm giving today, I'm kind of sparing you the, the gory details of what the things that I look at and more of a discussion of how complex the geolegalities of rape law are. So, so it won't be too gory or, uh, or difficult to, to talk about today. Um, I started at KU back in 2002 as an undergrad in environmental studies. I graduated in 2007 with a bachelor's of science in, in environmental studies. I then moved over to uh, the Department of Geography to study soils with Bill Woods. Um, I ended up changing my topic about a year in and because uh, I got really into, I took a class called the Geography of Genocide and that really fascinated me. So I switched pretty um, significantly to become a political geographer, looking at the geography of genocide and, and those the complexities of, of genocide in terms of spatiality. Uh, while I was doing my master's degree regarding uh, the violence in Uganda, um, I did a research project regarding um, the independence of Bangladesh in 1971, where 200,000 women were systematically raped in the independence movement and how a lot of those women, even though they lived through the independence, were actually kind of shunned from society because of the culture there. They were seen as, because they were raped, um, they kind of no longer existed in society. Their families uh, shunned them. They ended up, a lot of them, being homeless. So and they, didn't, they didn't physically die, but they ceased to exist within that society. So the notion of women's bodies actually being used as weapons, not only against themselves, but also their society in general, kind of got me really interested in terms of, of rape and conflict, which led me down the path of looking at the kind of rape laws and how complex these laws are. And, and so the geolegalities of rape kind of became my, my dissertation topic. So that's kind of the trajectory of where I've come from. It's been a very long path. <laughs> I'm looking to, I'm hoping to be done within the next six to eight months, so <laughs> ending my tenure here, uh, I think 11 to 12 years, so it'll be nice. Um, so thank you again for coming. What I'm going to start with, uh, and I'm sorry that the presentation's not working, hopefully the, the your handout will be sufficient. Um, not a lot of people are really familiar with what geographers actually do. A lot of people think they know what we do. Um, we're not really good at, at uh, telling everyone kind of what we do. So I'm going to give you a brief understanding of like what we actually, what, what geographers really do and we're very diverse in what we do. So it's a little bit difficult. So kind of first what really goes on in the discipline of geography, there's kind of three, arguably three main types of geographers. There's physical geographers. Um, these people tend to look at more of like the environment, the physical environment, um, soils, um, climate reconstruction over time, things like that, geomorphology. Um, there's also GIS, geographers, geographical information systems, and these tend to be the people that we uh, are thinking about now, and they make <coughs> maps, and they uh, computer-generated models of what's going on, and, and it's not really what I do. Um, there's also cartographers, it's kind of the traditional you know, map makers, geographers, place identifiers. And then there's human and cultural geography, which is kind of my home. So these are human and spatial interactions. Um, if you wanted to kind of tie it to another discipline, we're very closely linked to political geography, you know, poli-sci, some of us do political geography, some of us are more sociologists in terms of what we look at, some of us are more closely tied to um, anthropology. But looking at a lot of 
the interactions between people and their space and how those spaces and people and person interactions and whatnot kind of manifest. So legal geography falls into the subdiscipline of like critical human geography. For simplicity's sake, we'll just say human geography. Um, we use critical social theory to investigate various topics, geography and politics, post-colonial geographies. We use there's feminist geographers that use feminist theory to kind of look at the role of space and gender and whatnot. Um, legal geography specifically kind of builds on these movements that we saw within legal studies in the 1980s called the kind of law and movements. So law and society, law and psychology, law and sociology. So kind of looking at law through various other disciplinary lenses to see how law shapes people's minds, uh, people's lives, whatnot. So legal geography builds on this movement. Um, these movements kind of began challenging many of the basic assumptions of law. We'd like to see this as very abstract, out there, body, but you know, there's a lot of power relations bound up in law, and law affects who we are, who we think we are, where we act, what things are allowed in certain spaces, what actions are not allowed in certain spaces. So law is a very big part of shaping our society and also how we think about ourselves. So legal geography, it's kind of a subdiscipline of law and geography. There were legal scholars looking at the role of space and law, and then there were geographers looking at the role of law and space. And those two groups kind of came together under this new, what some legal geographers have called this new interdisciplinary intellectual project called legal geography. So they don't like to look at it as a subdiscipline, but rather a very interdisciplinary project where we have legal anthropologists, legal geographers, critical legal scholars all coming together and kind of pulling all of their different skills to look at the role of law in terms of space. So kind of broadly, what do legal geographers study? Um, a lot of it, as it does follow critical social theory, um, how and why law works to perpetuate particular power relationships, how law reaffirms certain, certain power relationships, um, how some laws are used to actively oppress people or exploit people so that they're not just these freestanding bodies, they're actually actively used in political ways to exploit, oppress, subjugate, etc. A lot of the studies aim to challenge the power of law that is used to like silence people, marginalize people, oppress people, so kind of challenging the out there abstract notion of law and showing how these can be really problematic. Um, and then also so like assessing the social constructiveness of legal discourses, so showing how law doesn't exist out there, we're actively using it to perpetuate certain views, certain moral <coughs> codes that we like to live by, etc. Um, more specifically, what legal geographers have kind of been studying over the last 15 to 20 years or so um, kind of laws regarding homelessness, how laws create spaces where homeless people can't be. So how laws actively push homeless people out of certain spaces and kind of regulate them to only being able to exist in certain spaces, kind of marginalizing them. Um, legally gendered spaces, where women are allowed, where men are allowed, where women aren't allowed, etc. Um, racism and gerrymandering, how laws can be used to actually bound certain spaces to push certain agendas, um, create legal spaces where certain races either do not feel welcome or are not welcome, and this is outside of, a lot of this is in the industrialized West. A lot of legal geographers tend to only look at um, Western Europe countries in the United States and Canada, mostly common law systems, which has been kind of a problem, and that's where the movement is kind of growing out of. Um, and then one of the recent trends in legal geography is starting to look at environmental legislation and how environmental laws are actually creating new zones where certain activities aren't allowed. So in terms of uh, marine zones where fishing is no longer allowed to protect certain species of fish or certain environmental areas, wilderness areas, preservation areas where um, normal activities of recreation or logging are not allowed because we're trying to preserve those spaces for certain reasons. Um, some of the gaps in the literature, and this is kind of where my study is starting to address where legal geography needs to grow. 
Um, typically, if you look at the literature, there aren't a whole lot of comparative legal theorists. Most of them look at domestic laws, usually within the United States, the UK, um, a few in, in Western Europe, but a lot of the legal literature focuses on goings on within the United States and, and the United Kingdom and Canada. So it's very kind of Western centric. It's very limited to common law legal systems, which are significantly different than civil law legal systems, which I'll talk about, and theocratic or religious based legal systems. So we're not really getting a full picture of kind of what the legal geography looks like out there because our studies have been very limited in the geographic scope of where these studies are occurring. Um, in the geography literature, there are huge gaps and there's not a lot of geographers looking at violence in any way. There were a scattering of, of studies in the early 90s. There have been a handful of studies in the last five or six years, but there's not a lot of geographers like actively engaging in spaces of violence, where violence occurs, how space and violence are related, right? So I'm also kind of addressing that gap in the geographic literature, excuse me, in the geographic literature. Um, and like I said, where are the geolegal studies outside of the industrialized West? Um, the handful of exceptions, there really aren't any. And of the handful that are looking outside the industrialized West, None of those are really geographers or trained geographers. The majority of those are legal anthropologists who are borrowing um, geographic terminology and, ge and, and parts of our discipline to build upon, which is kind of a problem because that's, it's an interdisciplinary pro project, but more geographers need to be involved. So going specifically into the geolegalities of rape, um, where do we typically find rape laws? And the simple answer is there's, if you're looking at what we call spatial scale, and scale can be used in a variety of ways, but I'm talking about administrative spatial scale. So if you think of governments, where governments are kind of located, you have city or municipal governments, you have state governments, you have national governments, and you have international governmental bodies. So these are kind of the spatial scales that I'm conforming to. And generally, your legal systems, because you need some kind of sovereign authority to enforce those, uh, coincide with uh, governmental spatial scales. So generally, when we're talking about laws, these are the same place, kind of same scales that we find in our laws. You find their city municipal laws regarding what can and can't go on within a city's jurisdictional area within the boundaries of the city. There are certain laws that dictate what can and can't go on within the state of Kansas, per se, right? So in Colorado, Marijuana has been decriminalized or legalized in certain ways, but in Kansas it's not, right? So you see kind of like the variability of laws even within the nation because there are state governments that regulate certain activities that can and cannot go on within that state boundary. Um, further, you see national laws, and then international laws tend to exist at um, the UN treaty bodies, um, ad hoc tribunals, tend to, in like the Rome Statute, the Geneva Conventions, these are kind of where we get a lot of our international laws, and countries have to be signatories of these treaties or these conventions. The problem with international laws, though, are though we could be signatories a lot, there's no unified body of authority to kind of enforce those. So they're not really that binding. It's more pick and choose, it's really complicated on whether you choose to adhere to those laws or not. Um, further kind of complicating this is that not everyone has the same type of legal system. Uh, in the United States, we have the common law legal system, which is built on precedence. A lot of our laws tend to build upon each other in terms of legal decisions, kind of informing further legal decisions. And you look backwards to see how judges ruled on certain legal decisions based on how they, um, how they interpreted the Constitution and what can and cannot go on. So common law, law, common laws within the common law system tend to be very vague because a lot of the decisions that you're making, you're looking at prior judicial um, rulings to inform your ruling. Whereas in civil law systems, it's very different in that the laws and the way the court systems work, the laws are very specific. You, have, you know exactly how many years in jail you're going to spend for certain crimes and certain levels of, of violence. The laws are coded very specifically. They tell you what rape is, what counts as rape? Is it only forcible, vaginal, 
uh, penetration can include any kind of sexual orifice. Does it have to be forcible? Is it what notion of consent are you using? They tend to be very, very specific so that the judges can very easily say whether or not a rape was a rape or not based on the law and enacting what sentence. If it was a nonviolent rape, maybe it only gets one to three years. If it was a rape that included violence to a certain degree, it might be five to seven years. If it was a very violent rape where the woman actually uh, was killed, it might be 10 to 15 years, right? Whereas in the common law systems, there's a lot more leeway in how the judge sentences um, crimes of rape because the laws are not very specific. And then three theocratic legal systems or religious legal systems are completely different in that those laws are based on religious by bylaws. So, and they tend to be variable in terms of what religion that theocratic law system is based upon. So, this kind of gets into the notion of, well, what counts as rape? Because we have our own notions of what we think rape is based upon our own historical understandings or our cultural understandings, what we've brought up, to, been brought up to believe. But if you look at kind of the legal definitions of rape, they're extremely variable. And that's because all legal systems are kind of built on a history and built on a culture. So how various cultures and states and nations and cities code rape depends on all of this, this backstory. So just looking at kind of a small subset of laws, this short list is a very short list of the various ways that law has been coded legally. So some laws call it a violation of chastity, which you can interpret that in a number of ways. Um, some laws call it non-consensual sex, sex, sexual intercourse, which kind of regulates that to only vaginal penetration by a man, because typically sexual intercourse is defined as one narrow set of circumstances. Um, some laws call rape carnal knowledge without consent. Others more, and if you'll, you'll find this more in civil law systems in the industrial, in Western Europe, typically call it penetration of sexual organs with other organs or instruments because they're taking a more, a more broad understanding of what rape is to include male victims, to include victims that are not penetrated vaginally but maybe penetrated in other orifices or victims that were not penetrated by an organ, but maybe by an instrument. So still calling that rape, but it's a little bit outside of, of kind of the, the traditional, if you will, understanding of what rape is. Um, other laws are forced copulation, forcible coitus, and forcible sexual relations. So some of them are a little more broad and encompassed rape. What rape is is encompassed <coughs> by more act. Yeah? The one I don't understand in that listing is <coughs> Carnal knowledge without consent, what does that really mean? If typically, if you really look into the law, it can be interpreted various ways, but carnal knowledge for the set of laws that typically use this kind of language usually just means sexual intercourse. But because of the cultures that these, not, these laws kind of come from, sexual intercourse isn't the language that they use. A lot of the carnal knowledge without consent laws typically tend to be in um, Northern Africa, um, the Middle East. A lot of, uh, if you want to say, typically nations that are dominated by uh, Islam or um, Islamic religion tend to call it carnal knowledge without consent. And this isn't a blanket statement, but typically this is where you find those laws. Um, they usually, they just don't use the same language of like sexual intercourse. For them, sexual intercourse means carnal knowledge, but they're a little bit interchangeable in that way. Does that make sense? Um, so then, moving on from like these def different definitions, we have to ask ourselves, well, who can be raped, right? Who can consent to actually having intercourse? Um, so this is a lot of legal systems, only women can be raped legally. If you look at the laws, they're only housed in male-female terms. So it'll be forcible sexual intercourse by a male upon a woman. Um, sexual, in, like sexual, the carnal knowledge would be, you know, carnal knowledge of a female without consent. Uh, a lot of them are very gendered. So only women in those areas with those laws can be raped. Male rape doesn't legally exist. Whereas laws that 
don't define a gender, and like men and women can be legally raped. So a lot of laws in Western Europe, North America, increasingly in South America, and also Asia are calling are going with persons instead of man woman. They go with persons so that it's an ungendered rape law so that male victims can be included. Um, furthermore, there's there's certain groups of people that culturally we don't see them as giving the right not to consent. So sex workers um, tend to you don't bring cases of rape very often because they work in the sexual trade happen to be raped just because of preconceived notions of what those people do. Also, a lot of rape laws don't cover rape in marriage. Like wives can actually not withdraw consent because the man has, as a husband, has a right to his wife sexually. So a lot of, and this is changing. I'll show you. I'll, there's maps kind of showing this, <laughs> which they're not in color, so it's going to be a little bit difficult. Um, but more and more, we're seeing clauses where rape in marriage is actually becoming a legal issue, where wives can actually bring their husbands to court for non-consensual sex. Um, and then also legal definitions change over space and they change over time. Uh, there have been a lot of late rape reforms in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, a, lot of, a lot of laws are becoming ungendered. Pakistan's law has recently become ungendered. India's law has recently become ungendered. Uh, in the January of this year, the United States law at the FBI level of rape became ungendered. So. These things are changing over time. Our, our cultural understanding of what rape can be tends to change over time, and what we accept as victims of rape can change over time. So unfortunately, these maps are not in color. Uh, so the, for, the top map is gendered and ungendered rape laws. You typically find your ungendered rape laws in North America, United States laws ungendered, Canadian laws ungendered, Western Europe, the majority of laws in Western Europe are ungendered now. Like I said, Pakistan's law is ungendered. Uh, India's law is now ungendered. You find gendered laws a lot in, um, in Africa. The majority of Africa's laws are actually gendered, so only females can be victims of rape in those areas. China's law is gendered. Uh, most of Indonesia and Indochina, their laws are gendered. Um, and then the unknown and unclear complicated, those are when you get into laws where it's not really clear. So a law might say forcible sexual intercourse by a person against another person. So there's no gendered language there, but rape is still only coded as sexual intercourse. So that's, yeah. I've got to ask another question. Sure. I really want to understand this. I'm about to go to boundary training okay. in our denomination. Mm -hmm. And that would be interesting.